First Star Logistics presents In the Trenches with Dave Lapham, and very special guest today is the iconic, the legendary Mike Reed. Mike, how you doing, my man? <laughs> Dave, what an introduction, buddy. How are you? Uh, yeah, you uh, don't. You're overselling me real early here. I'm, not, you know, we're not going to have anywhere to go. <laughs> well, I, I um, always say that that Paul Brown was very, very interested in the total human being, not just the football player. And Paul Brown wanted intelligent football players. He trusted intelligent football players, and he felt like football was just the beginning of your working life. And what were you going to do with your working life after football? And you are a tremendous example of what Paul Brown was referencing, what he was talking about. And we had a lot of teammates in the 70s and 80s that that fits the bill, and it doesn't fit anyone any better or bigger than you, Mike. Well, you're, you're being extraordinarily generous, Dave. I really appreciate that. You know, that was absolutely that. I mean, I will back you up on that. That was exactly what Paul's uh, idea was, um, you know, um, that it was, uh, of course, in those days, you know, it was, a, as you well know, it was a different game uh, in every way and certainly profoundly different financially. Um, we didn't have quite as much at stake as these kids do today. So, uh, you know, yeah, by the time your, your body's over, as far as that game concern, is concerned, you're still an extraordinarily young man. Right. You know, and what are you gonna what are you gonna do with the rest of your life? Although I have to tell you this funny, if you have a minute I'll tell you this funny Absolutely. story. The year after I I uh, stopped playing, I think they drafted Eddie Edwards and Wilson Whitley, the two defensive linemen. Yes. Do you is that am I accurate on that? I think you might be. I know in my draft class we drafted Billy Kohler. Remember Billy? Bill, sure yeah, do. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Bill Colors. And, and you're right. Eddie and Eddie and Wilson Whitley were shortly thereafter. You're exactly right. Well, I remember this, and it really endeared. I was just completely charmed and touched by this comment Paul made. They asked him when they drafted uh, Eddie Edwards, what do you like most about this young man you've drafted? And Paul replied, he doesn't play the piano. <laughs> Which I thought was... Joe, the old men have a really beautiful sense of humor about it. As a matter of fact, when I went in, I went in and talked to them to talk to him and tell him that I, I thought that I was, my playing days were over, even though I was still pretty young. He was very gracious about it, Dave. And he, um, very gracious and said, well, if you, you're out there in the world and, uh, you know, you change your mind, you always have a home here. Uh, of course, there's a, one other way to think about it too is, Nobody tried to talk me out of it. Oh, <laughs> maybe they were glad I was moving on. No, I don't. I don't think so. I think they just probably realized that you know you you're not an impetuous guy. You're a guy that uh, was a deep thinker, and I I do remember that. I remember on on flights, man. You were you were a guy that you were always you know reading, and you just you're a deep thinker type guy. I mean, I just I just always respected the the heck out of you. And I, I bet Paul Brown was like, Oh, you know, this is, this is the way it, uh, the way it's going to be. Um, you know, cause you look at it, you're like, you said, you're still a, a man physically that could still play. I just remember my rookie year trying to pass protect against you the first time. And I, I came back to tiger Johnson. I said, what the hell do I do? And he just, he just started laughing. He goes, that's what everybody uh, says when they try to pass protect against Mike Reed. Talk about quick twitch. You know, everybody says, oh, this guy's got tw quick twitch. You were unbelievably first step quickness, overall quickness. I mean, I, sometimes I, I'd be like, I know I didn't close my eyes. How the hell did he get from point A to point B so quickly? Where, where did that come from? I mean, that quick twitch you had. I Well, you know, Davey, for one thing, uh, I wasn't a big, you know, I wasn't very big. I mean, I came into the, I came into the league, you know, bigger. Probably 255, and then uh, when I when Arthur Jones, you remember Crazy Arthur, and sure, he, uh, was the inventor of Nautilus equipment. Yeah, and we got that equipment, and I went down and spent a, a month of a summer with Arthur in Florida. Uh, what an experience that was! But I lost. Um, I got stronger, but I got lighter, and uh, I actually probably got too light. 
so that speed was what I had. I wasn't going to, you know, uh, and those, you know, the blocking was so different then. You, you see, you, you see it's such a different game now, the offensive line, the defensive line. Well, the defensive line play not so much, but the offensive line strategy is so different, much different than, than all those years ago when, when, when we played. And it nose up on a guy. I had to. Ha- I had to be on a shoulder. I had to be in a gap or on a shoulder. Nose up was not, you know. And not too long after I stopped, the nose tackle became a big uh, force. Mm-hmm. Well, I would have never, Davey. I would have never been. I didn't have the range. I had great speed for about five yards. My forty speed was okay. It was okay. I was not a sprinter, but. Um, a nose tackle would have not – that would have been the end of it for me. They would have had to – because those guys – that was the beginning of those nose tacklers. Remember in those days was the beginning of the 300-pounders. Right, guess. right. Uh, people in that – and, and really essentially they're what they wanted them to do was just be in the way. Don't let them push you out of the way and let the other guys make the tackle. Yeah, I didn't have the range I would because I didn't have the – I didn't have the overall speed you need for the outside rush. I don't know where I would have ended up, you know, because it was beginning in those days to, and also, um, I'm sure you don't want to, you know, we don't want to cast too much light on this. It was probably the very beginning of the, uh, I've, I've become good friends with Matt Millen, mm-hmm. who had a great career with uh, San Francisco and then the, and then Oakland, right. they were Oakland in those days. Right. Matt and I became friends because we we're both Penn State guys. And uh, he said to me, uh, Dave, that if for, in order for my size to continue playing, I would have probably had to have gotten on to some artificial stuff. Yeah, you know? right. Whether or not that's true or not, I mean, that's, that's a long, long time ago. But I, I, I know we can talk about that. I know that how it transformed that offensive line of the Steelers from one year to the next. So yeah. um, whether I would have done that or not, I, quite honestly, I mean, I was sort of a looney tune in those days, so one never knows. Well, your short space quickness, though, was just phenomenal. I mean, honestly, the best that I ever played against in, in, in a sh- that short space quickness was dynamic. And when you talk about you came into the league as the seventh pick in the draft, in, uh, in 1970, right. you were the Outland Trophy winner, the country's outstanding college, collegiate lineman at Penn State, All-American, obviously, and you win Defensive Rookie of the Year. Then you're uh, NFL All-Pro in 72 and 73. It's just uh, just incredible, the early success that you had. What do you attribute it to? Well, that's a, that's a, really, that's a really great question, and it brings back – it's a strange thing, Dave, to hear you articulate that because I don't relate to to those things having happened to me. Hmm. Uh, it, it was a game. The game was always. I see these kids today. Some of these kids today, of course, you know the motivation. I mean, the, the financial remuneration now is uh, is absurd, and and it went from. It is certainly because of that gone from a six month a year uh, job to a 12 month a year. Um, I just, I just, um, boy, I don't know. That's an interesting thing. What, a, what would I attribute that to? Certainly I, I came out of college um, and was used to winning, yeah, you know, because right. it was under Joe Paterno, my sophomore year was Joe's first year as head coach. Hmm. And then I was redshirted one year, and then the, my redshirt junior and senior year, we went undefeated and had a 30-game winning streak from seven games the year before, and then went to two bowl games, was ranked number two in the country both years. And so Joe, um, uh, he was, you know, it was the first early years of his program. So you... Um, it became pretty clear about what you needed to do if you were going to play this game. He he would not tolerate um, he would not tolerate half speed and things like that. And and he would teach you, of course, if you go half speed, you're running far greater risk of getting injured. 
So I was there, you know. I mean, I certainly didn't come into the league, Dave, thinking, well, I'm a first-round draft pick, and therefore, blah, blah, blah. As a matter of fact, I remember in the locker room, I came as a as before the season started at a press conference, and they had a Baldwin piano at the, down at Spinney Field. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I played a tune and played something, you know. And the first guy I met from the Bengals, the first two guys I met, were Pat Masson and Steve Tomasak. <laughs> the late, great Steve Tomasak. Yep. Well, Masson was about, what What was he, Dave? 5'11"? I was going to say, if he's six feet, that was about it. <laughs> yeah, about it. Six feet. Maybe. 265 pounds yep. of one muscle piled on top of another. Right. Tomasak was about 6'5", 270, he, and, and with a 33-inch waist. He was a mountain. I looked at those guys and I thought, I want my, I want to go home. I want my mom. <laughs> I, I don't think I belong here because I was just not a weightlifter. I was not a, you know, like you said, you've been very sweet to point out. I mean, my, my game was speed. I think I figured out that speed was the only edge that I had. I certainly didn't have it mentally and I didn't have it uh, strength wise. So, Speed was going to either get me there or get me killed. <laughs> I remember yeah. those uh, those defenses, though, at Penn State. Steve Smarless, Dennis Oncotz, Jack Ham, Mike Reed. You guys were you guys were unbelievable. Those those uh, Penn State defenses were that was a bunch of men over there. We had we had a we had a great defense, but on the other side of the ball, then we had a uh, a, a running button back named uh, Frank Harris and Lydell Mitchell, right? And, <laughs> Well, and we used to say to Paterno, you know, if you're such a coaching genius, <laughs> this was years years later when Franco had this amazing uh, pen, uh, Steeler career. Right. Joe, if you're such a coaching genius, how come you made uh, – how come Franco Harris was a blocking back in college? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And he always had a pat answer, you would say, because he was blocking for Lydell Mitchell. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, that made sense. But, you know, Franco was not – you would have never guessed and to see this guy in college that he was going to go on to be one of the great running backs in, in NFL history because really? he was good. He was good, but uh, not not to have the kind of career that he ended up having. You could, I did say the same thing with Hammer too, Jack. Yeah, Jack was a uh, you know he and he had all those Steeler years. You know he played at like two fifteen outside linebacker. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. So those were good. Those were good years at Penn State, and I'm I'm um, I'm happy to talk about that. I, it was a, all the more, you know, Dave, uh, the tragedy. You know, um, it, it rarely is tragedy tragedy an applicable world, word in things like sports downfalls. But that whole Penn State uh, thing uh, right. some years ago was just an authentic. Tragedy because I, you know, I know who Joe was and yeah, and, uh, yeah. But they were that was interesting. They were his. Uh, we were his uh, first guys. We were his first guys. I think, I think we uh, we stayed in his heart after that. Yeah, boy, he he struck gold early on. There's no no question about that. So you transition from your professional football career. You decide to to go into the music industry. And you not really, not not really. Let me interrupt you. Dave. Okay. I, I just I think about now as I'm an old man, you know, and entering old and and you're knowing that you're very kind to even <laughs> want to want to talk because, uh, because I think about those days and now at this stage of life, though I've loved my life as in writing music. I love had more good fortune and met more amazing people than I'd like. You'd have a right to think you were ever, were ever going to meet. But I, I got to tell you, when I when I entered old age, I started thinking back to the days when, when you and I were teammates. And and uh, I began, I can let myself think, you know, Reed, you should have should have played a couple, you should have played a while longer. Really? You did have second thoughts? No, I never not, did not then, until not I then. got old. Okay, right. Not not then. Not never never until I entered old age. And there's a certain thing about being this age now. You be, you begin. There's lots more to do. Hopefully, I'll live 
um, a long, long while yet, but, yeah. uh, but you begin to assess the past a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I think about, um, think about having played longer. I, I, but then, but then I have to remember that I, I have, I know, I'm not sure, buddy, that I had another game in me. I just think through knees and a uh, hole in my shoulder and a crack vertebra in my uh, C4, not C4, but L4, L3 and L4, which, you know, with we're going to have, us old guys going to have problems in the back. It's going to be L3, L4. Yep. And and um, I probably didn't have another game. In me. But I think about it. I think about it. Of course, we're always – you look at what the game has become in this culture, and um, it certainly wasn't it wasn't that then, but it was probably beginning to become that. But who knew who knew it was going to become what has it become in this culture? Well, you got your degree in music from Penn State. When did you actually start loving music? When did you start playing the piano? Were you like even like young, young, like six, seven, eight years old, young? Yeah, my grandmother it was my earliest memory in life. Really, being conscious. My earliest memory, conscious moment in life was when I was three. I don't know if people remember when they're younger than that. For me, it, I was three years old, and my grandmother wow. next door, down the hill, had an old upright piano on the sun porch. And they brought my great grandmother Schwartz down from the farm when she could no longer live up there, and she would sit in the uh, in the uh, sun porch there where the piano was and so i had asked for lessons i had requested lessons to my mom and dad you know i grew up in a blue collar family as i imagine you did dave yeah. I, I, I just guess and uh they were shocked you know could i would i be uh could i have to take piano lessons so they they dragged that piano up the hill and i started piano lessons and then years a few years later when i learned to play my great grandmother would sit there, and I would play these. Uh, she loved America. She loved uh, UB, UB Blake, and she loved um, uh, Rag American Ragtime. Mm-hmm. And so I would play her these songs, and uh, that yeah, that was the earliest. Um, and so, and then uh, the music that I so you know you hear a lot of music, but the music I really first became riveted by listening to were hymns in church mm-hmm. when we would go to the church services and there was something about those those songs of surrender those hymns the beautiful church hymns and i just loved so uh, it was it was really and it was in my life from the time i was very very young i remember you performing um as a classical pianist with the symphony in cincinnati and i guess you've done it in dallas and utah and any other places as well i mean performing for the symphony were you more nervous doing that or more nervous getting ready to play the Pittsburgh Steelers? No, facing a symphony. Oh, I'm, I, I, you mentioned that, and I'm paralyzed. With, <laughs> I'm paralyzed at this moment, Dave, remembering how terrifying that was. Wow. Yeah, because I would, it would just look. A lot of it was there, – there was a certain element of, of oh, here's the, 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 the beast soothing his savage soul with the songs of the <laughs> of the galaxy, you know, and that nonsense. And, you know, the media, my God, the right. media, they love to get a hold of stuff like that and sure. just blow it wildly out of proportion. Me with a symphony orchestra, I was wildly out of my league. And I was very, very lucky to perform with a couple of wonderful conductors that took my hand and led me through that foot. I was not. Uh, it was a little bit of a little bit of a of a going to see the going to see the, the thing at the zoo. You know, we're going to go see this big thing. Do these amazing this big thing at the zoo can do these tricks, <laughs> and because you would have never, nobody would have ever said to me. And I, if if you have any young budding writers or, or musicians listening to you, Dave, nobody would have would have listened to anything I did when I was young in music and said, yeah, he should have a life in music. Wow. Uh, I didn't have that. I was not a gifted kid. You know, I was uh, nature. God gave me the love of it, but uh, I've always been trying to catch up talent wise. So. Did you ever worry about her injuring your hands while you were playing with, with your love for the piano and music in general? 
No, and but 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 I think you know I had every finger. I don't know if you did, uh, uh, if you did or not, but I had every finger on my both hands dislocated yep. at least once yeah. through <laughs> high school, college, and the pros. Yep. And you just you know you look at it and say, well, that's weird, and pull it, <laughs> pop it back in. Right. And, and I think I think uh, playing piano all those years, um, but just just putting your hands in the keyboard and and I love to play. I, when I was very young, I fell madly in love with being able to sit at a piano and make some sound come out. And I think it probably kept the arthritis in check, you know. Right. And, and um, But no, no. I knew the kind of music that I would be drawn to was not going to require a like a, a an extraordinary technique the way you hear in, the, you know, from from the from uh, the great pianists, serious pianists, you know, who, they also are on an intellectual level, too, that is unique. So I knew that was going to be my world, so I never worried too much about the injuries to the hand. So in 1980, you decided to move to Nashville, I think it was in that time frame, to pursue songwriting. Yeah. And and you've done a remarkable, uh, had a remarkable career in that regard. In 2005, you're inducted into the Nashville Songwriter Hall of Fame, for crying out loud. I mean, you've, uh, you've written hits, number ones, you know, for, uh, in top tens for Marie Osmond, Tanya Tucker, Conway Twitty. I mean, Ronnie Millsap. I remember Stranger in My House. I was first time I heard that, and I knew you wrote it. I was like, man, Mike Reed, getting after it in 1982, that album inside Ronnie Millsap's album. I mean, what, what led you to songwriting and how competitive is that business? Dave Lapham here, and every day I am grateful for my experience to have played professional football. As a player, I realize self-motivation, leadership, and appreciating your teammates are key. At First Star Logistics, you can use those same attributes to create the life you want for you and your family. Build your future by working hard like I did. You'll see results both on and off the field. Call First Star Logistics today and be part of our winning team. It it's brutally competitive, Dave. It now more than ever. If you think of it in terms of competition, it, if you if you think in terms of how am I going to get a leg up in this, right? Um, then you because boy, particularly here, and it's always been this way in Nashville. People, young people, uprooting their lives and coming here and starving for years and years. Um, waiting for that yeah, and doing their work and eventually, you know, uh, having the faith that they will uh, improve to the point that they stumble onto the secret of writing a hit song or having a song recorded by a great artist who makes it a hit song. There's a, there's a decided difference there. Um, yeah. Susie and I, my, Susie and I have all these years, we, got married we were together for years and then we got married in 79 and um i got a uh, a, le- a note from somebody i had sung a demo for a friend in in cincinnati and he pitched it here to kenny rogers well every everyone had the song for kenny rogers you know in those days. <laughs> and it ran across the publisher's desk and the guy liked my singing but he didn't like the song so he got a hold of me and would you be interested in talking about this? So, and country music for me, Dave, or Nashville was like Mars. It was never a dream of any kind. Mm. So I got in the car and I was surprised. It was only four and a half hour drive. Came down and they offered me uh, a writing a position to write, which I didn't know that existed. You write, you write all day, and they offered me a hundred dollars a week on the condition. That we that I moved to Nashville, but they weren't going to do it to have me write long distance. So um, my wife Susie was uh, anxious to venture out, and why me? I'm a, as you said, Dave, not an impetuous guy. I was considering, let's see, what are we going to do? Shall we? And while I was considering what I wanted to do, she packed all her stuff in the car. And said, <laughs> I'm going to Nashville. Are you coming? <laughs> so <laughs> we ended up here. 
and 80 and uh, started trying to figure it, figure it out. You know, it's a, but you can't, for young writers to come here, you, you really cannot think of in terms of the odds for competition. Your, your writers are driven. They're, first of all, songwriters are not, well, here's the old, the old, uh, you know, young, young kid, uh, young boy says to his dad, uh, dad, I want to be a songwriter when I grow up. The father replies, well, son, you can't have it both ways. <laughs> <laughs> so you, it's purely, it's purely, baby, you have to, you have to just, it has to be something that's in you. Yeah. And, and, and it has to be something that, uh, um, you know, you have to be sufficiently compelled. I've told young writers, if, if there's anything else in the world that you can be happy doing, you should probably do that. Hmm. But if you are really sufficiently compelled, and by that, Dave, I mean, are you, are you willing to show up and show up relentlessly every day? Right. If you find you're sufficiently compelled, then things like discipline and commitment will come in handy. But if you're not, if you're just going to, if you're playing the odds, or if you say, I want to go down there and make a bunch of money, then I would suggest you, you do, you do something else because, uh, there'll be a million reasons to stop doing this. Did, did but the... if, if, if your love of it is, uh, or you're just the, uh, it's even beyond a love. I don't know. It's almost a, an obsession. And if it, if it's strong enough, then it can see you through. Did the, uh, the, the, the grind of being a professional athlete and the discipline and the stick to and all that that you, you have to have to be able to succeed in the NFL to the level that you did, did it help you in your transi- transition to ultimately songwriting? I, I think, Dave, I think really the common denominator, and I've thought about that over the years and been, been asked, although I don't get interviewed that much, but I've been asked. I, th- I really think it's, they're they're two disparate things. Certainly, yeah. you have athletic competition, right? And then you have the emotional, psychological, mental approach of what you're of trying to bring things out of the atmosphere into into hearing, right? So other people can hear. And I think it's the same with mathematics. I think it's the same. My son is in graduate school in psychology, and he is just on fire about it. Um. You're doing your uh, podcast here. Uh, um, it could be teaching. It could be being tearing cars apart. I think the common denominator is you really the sufficient passion mm-hmm. and love for something. Mm-hmm. And maybe maybe it's sports was. I know I know uh, I would every I never ever went to camp out of shape and thought okay I'll use camp to get in shape right and. And I remember why why that was when I was a sophomore. We had an offensive tackle um, at Penn State, and uh, and they, they used to do the the pre uh, the, the pre you know when we're working out the preseason stuff uh, media day, and it appeared in the paper. We had this offensive tackle, and uh, I won't mention his name, although it's a long time ago. Rich right. Buzzin was his name, and on the Local paper, Paterno was assessing the team, and he said, I'm not sure about buzzing. He looks a little fat to me. <laughs> and man, Dave, did that freak me out. I thought, he's <laughs> never, ever going to be able to say that about me. There you go. There you so, go. And I always enjoyed Did you enjoy working out on your own? Yeah, definitely. You yeah. know, I definitely did. And uh, Yeah, same you know. here. I just, just enjoyed that and. I enjoyed the piano. Uh, it's more than enjoying. I mean, it's the, it's the, um, it's, they're the markers of your life, you know? So, um, I think it's a matter of just committing, uh, going all in, um, on something you love. And in my case, it happened to be two things that are, that are substantially unrelated, I suppose. So how many top 10 hits and number one hits? I mean, I know at it, it one, it's got to be at least in the, what, 25, 30 number ones? I mean, how many number ones have you written for, for artists over the years, Mike? Um, I think roughly in the neighborhood of 22. Wow. 
and and then and then there are top ten and top twenties, and um, it may make up a catalog. You know, I mean, I ideally, I, and I I have a little publishing company that uh, my wife and I run, and so um, yeah. But but I got to tell you what now there there are there are friends of mine down here, dear friends of mine that are by nature what you would call hit songwriters. They write songs that, regardless of who's going to record them, um, they will be hit. Of course, a lot of those tend to be radio hits, you know. Right. Now that, which is which is fine, you know, you you, which is great. They tend to disappear, and when a radio hit disappears, it generally disappears forever. You know, where where in in what I was fortunate enough to write songs that made sense to me to write. And I, I was also working with a guy named Rob Galbraith, who won't mean, that won't name won't mean to anybody in your audience, but it means everything in the world to me. Hmm. He, he made me write. He made me write. He was the first guy to ask me if I believed in a certain line. And I thought, what does that have to do with anything? And he said, well, if you don't believe it, how are you going to expect strangers to believe it and he he was a real education as far as writing goes so um yeah i've lost my my train of thought exactly what i was saying but uh there are there are people that can write to construct what i did is i rob rob said you have to you have to write um that which you're interested in that which resonates with you and then the question would be that assumes that you're interested in something, right? You're interested in the way human beings behave towards one another. Are you going to write it truthfully? Are you going to write a, a you know, a Hallmark card? What are you going to do? In my case, baby, I, I just had a slightly different bent musically that it attracted people who wanted to say something different musically. And I had a lot of number one that were number ones because of the size of the artist who recorded them. Would you, and may or not have been, uh, you know, legit number one in that way. But, the, you know, I, I've often said, you know, I had a lot of number ones that a lot of great singers dragged up the charts, kicking and screaming all the way. <laughs> all right. Mr. Humble, yeah. would you consider yourself a contemporary country music writer? Or what would you consider well, I yourself? Would, <laughs> Yeah, you know those those kinds of ways. Of, I don't, I don't. Um, I think it's really, really. If you're a traditional country music lover, if you love traditional country music, you're going to hear the traditional country music lover complain about the contemporary music okay. that's coming out of country music now. I'm not one of those. I I don't think into. I did to me, Dave. Uh, I I love. And I've worked very, very hard because I love it so much. At the feet of my heroes, my the lyric writers who were heroes of mine. And again, they may be people that uh, are. There are some that are that are massive stars, and there are some that are a little more obscure. And so to learn, to learn to to speak, to learn to tell that story in as few words as possible. Right. Um, that is really what I, I worship at the altar of that. Musical, um, the musical clothing that a lyric wears changes generation to generation. That's simply going to happen. That is simply good. Every young generation, every generation has the language they want to use to say pretty much the same thing that is said in every generation. Human beings, what is the great mystery in life is the mystery of love what in the world is that How, why does it die why does it last why does it even happen so writers are always going to write about that you know right but the sound of the music the the clothing you you dress the lyric up in changes and it's and it's very different now it's an entirely different thing now and some people complain about it i don't i I just want to know from a singer, do you believe what you're singing, trying to convince me of? Do you believe this? And if I sense the singer is really trying to convince me of what they're saying, then well, the trappings, I don't, I don't care one way or another about it. 
Do you have a favorite, Mike? Do you have an all-time favorite song that you wrote, or do you have multiples? I have favorites of mine. They might be songs you've not ever heard. Huh. Um, one of my favorite songs, though, it is, it's on a, it's just an album cut on a Kenny Chesney album. Uh, a couple of Chesney uh, records ago called uh, Always Gonna Be You. Hmm. And um, I, 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 that song means a lot to me mm-hmm. because it is the truest thing probably I've ever written about Sue and I. I mean, um, hmm. she does not... My wife's one of the best people I know, but she does not suffer BS uh, gladly, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gotcha. So if I try this, uh, I try this, you know, too much. and so that uh, song, Always Gonna Be You, is probably, she said uh, that she likes that song. That's probably the truest thing. Then I would say, you know, I can't, I think the I, I Can't Make You Love Me, the Bonnie song is, is um, I wouldn't avoid that, you know. I mean, uh, saying that, uh, that I like uh, what I like about that song is the economy of words to say to say this one thing, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And and I don't think I like I like the fact that there's nothing there doesn't seem to be any fat in that song. Um, the fat is all out of it. Which and then of course you know we we got. The gods shined on us, Dave, by uh, by uh, her recording that thing because she she took that thing to the world. You know, it was too uh, not too long after that came out that uh, that song was no longer mine. Or Alan Chamblin, the guy I wrote it with, it was no longer ours. It was now belonged to her and and, and other people and what they wanted to make of it. Well, Mike, you're a uh... This has been a joy, really has, and you're an extremely uh, intelligent, sensitive, uh, tremendous human being who is just unbelievable achiever, you know, to, uh, to achieve the level that you achieved that in football, and then a second career, and there are so many teammates, you know, the Tommy Casanovas, Bob Johnson in the business world, Tommy in, uh, in, in the medical and in, uh, political world, and uh, Bob Trumpy in the broadcast world yourself. It's it's incredible how many teammates of that era of Cincinnati Bengals football uh, basically lived up to what Paul Brown was talking about, that this was in a short time frame of your working career, and it's a platform, and use the platform and, and move on and do other things. And, and you are a shining star on our First Star Logistics in the Trenches podcast with myself, and I, I really appreciate your time, sir. Dave, you're very, very generous to me, you know, extremely. You know, all those lovely things that you said about me, I want you to write those down and send them uh, <laughs> to my wife, okay, so that I can, I, can, I can get that out and read those to her, you know, about, oh, probably once a week. I know, honey, look here, Dave Lapham, you're just, you're, 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 this is, he's got the real, he's got the, uh, he's got the, the facts on me. There you but, go. Uh, you're, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe Paul was on something, you know, that, that, that he, that he was interested in people who were interested in the, Joe was the same way at Penn State. And he, yeah. that's why we never had athletic storm. We didn't have any of it, anything like that. And because he wanted you to have a full college experience, he didn't want you to be just a football player. So yeah, well, you're, you've been very, very kind, Dave. I appreciate it. And, uh, always always a pleasure to talk to you buddy thanks mike you've lived an extraordinary life my man appreciate your time